Teshdele, everyone. Hello. And uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Tibet Talks. I'm Tenchu Gyatso with International Campaign for Tibet, and I'm pleased to be your uh, host today. We have two special guests today uh, to discuss an important book about Sera Monastery, one of Tibet's uh, greatest monastic universities located just north of the Tibetan capital of Lhasa. Founded in 1419, Sera Monastery at one time held more than 9,000 monks from across the Tibetan Buddhist world. The story of Sera Monastery is important as it also mirrors the greater history, significance, status of Tibet and the Tibetan people. You can get a taste of Tibet's rich cultural heritage, its destruction, its struggle uh, for survival in exile as well as in Tibet under uh, Chinese occupation. Our guests today are the authors of this wonderful book. Um, we are first joined uh, by uh, Professor Jose uh, Carbazon here. Um, professor uh, Carbazon is a distinguished professor of religious studies and the 14th Dalai Lama professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is author, editor of a dozen books and many articles on various aspects of Tibetan religion and religious studies. Uh, please join me to welcome um, Professor Jose Carbazon to Tibet Talks. Thank you. Um, we, our second guest uh, uh, is from India, Balakupe. So because of the time difference, we did a pre-recorded uh, interview and we'll um, share that later. But joining me also today in this conversation is my colleague, uh, John Neville, who is our resident uh, book reviewer. For those of you who read our quarterly Tibet Watch newsletter, you will recall John's early uh, review of the Sarah Monastery book uh, in one of our um, previous uh, Tibet watches. John, thanks for joining today. For our viewers who are watching this live, we'll, be, uh, we'll have a uh, time for questions at the end. So please, those joining on Facebook can post their questions right under the live stream here. And if you're not on, uh, watching on our website, you can also email them to us at comments at uh, uh, safetibet.org. So with that, um, we want to begin the conversation first. Um, uh, Hosella, I wanted to ask, well, first of all, thank you. It's good to see you uh, here and uh, ask a little bit about the uh, history of the book, why you wrote it, what is your connection to Sarah Monastery? Um, and if you could just start um, with that. Sure. I um, became, uh, I first started studying Buddhism in the late 70s. And in 1977, I went to Dharamsala and was studying at the uh, Tibetan Library, Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. During that time, I became a monk. And then I went back to uh, study at the University of Wisconsin under Geshe Lundrup Serpa, who uh, was a monk. Of, of Sarah, and at that time, maybe the only pro professor in a, a Western university who was also a, a monk. So after I finished my coursework, he sent me to Sarah in India, in Bailakupe, um, to study with some of his students, and I spent five years there from 1980 to 85. Were you, and, were you and Sarah together? Yeah, so we were both there. I think at around the same time, but we never met each other. And you might wonder how that's possible, but Sarah is really like a small city. It has, you know, at that time, it has probably already a couple of thousand monks. It went on to grow to around 4,000 uh, in, in exile. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we were both monks of Sarah. And then um, as, the, as the year 2019, I mean, in, in the interim, I went to Tibet several times. And I did research on the history of Sarah in Tibet. And then as 2019 approached, 2019 was the 600th anniversary of the founding of Sarah. So with grants from the Robert Ho Foundation and the Guggenheim Foundation, we were able to carve out some time um, to, to write the book. Um, and our goal was really to do it as a tribute to the monastery and to celebrate the 600th anniversary of the monastery. 
Wonderful. Uh, Professor Husala, so um, before I hand over to John, I just wanted to ask maybe if you could, for our viewers, uh, set a little context on um, Dara Monastery, what kind of monastery it was, and um, you know, we refer to it as one of the dancers. So, what uh, can you explain that so we have a context? Sure. So, of course, there were hundreds or thousands of monasteries all over Tibet, um, but the three largest monasteries were all located in central Tibet, uh, either in or not far from Lhasa. Um, these were the monasteries that grew largest in size over time. Um, the first of these is the monastery of Ganden that was founded by Tsongkhapa in 1409. And then the monastery of Drepung, which is located um, just west of Lhasa, about a couple of maybe five or six kilometers west of Lhasa. And it was founded by a disciple of Tsongkhapa whose name was Jamyang Chuje. And then, and that was founded in 1416, and then Sarah was founded in 1419 by another disciple of Tsongkhapa, whose name was uh, Jamchen Chuji. So all three of these monasteries started out as relatively small institutions, but over time, um, as scholastic studies developed within the monasteries, they grew to mammoth proportions. So, you know, it, it was traditionally said that Sarah had 3,000, no, that the, the Ganden had 3,300 monks, Sarah had 5,500, and Drepung had 7,700. But those figures are very old. And my estimate is that in 1959, Sarah had, you know, upwards of 9,000 monks just by itself. Um, so really the Densas are great monastic universities. They had a 20 year long program of studies that culminated in an academic degree called Geshe. Um, and they produced some of the greatest scholars and really we can say political figures since many of the great lamas that rule Tibet uh, as regents in between the Dalai Lamas came from these monasteries. Thank you for, for that description. Um, I'll pass it over to uh, John now to delve a little bit uh, more into the book and um, ask you some questions, John. Thank you, Tencho. Professor, you, if we have upwards of 9,000 monks, they're from all across Tibet. They're also from across the broader Tibetan Buddhist world. That means you have people who are speaking different languages, different dialects. Some of them are very far away from their homes. How does the monastery manage to sort of uh, administer all these people? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, Tibet is, um, all of Tibet shared certain cultural similarities. You know, um, all Tibetans practiced a form of Tibetan Buddhism. They all spoke a form of Tibetan, but the form of Tibetan that's spoken in one area is not the same as it's spoken in another area. So my uh, own teacher, for example, um, he's from Tsang in Western Tibet. Geshe Zupa was from Tsang in Western Tibet. So when people from this area came to the monastery in central Tibet, they speak a certain form of Tibetan that's called Uke. Um, and monks from Tsang speak Tsangke, the language of Tsang. And it's not really possible to, to communicate across this linguistic barrier. It's not, a, it's not an easy thing. The same is true of Eastern, of Eastern Tibet. People from Amdo and Kham spoke their own, we, if we can want to call it this, dialects of Tibetan that were not really mutually understandable. So when monks from these from these areas came, they entered what were known as Kamsens or regional houses. And these were monks from the same region that they came from. In these Kamsens, they, could communicate with other monks of their same region in their own regional dialect, but then slowly they became acculturated to the language of central Tibet, which was also the language of debate. Um, so they had to learn this at least enough so that they could debate, which was such an important part of the monastic curriculum. So over time, they slowly learned central Tibetan dialect um, so the Kamsan was a very important institution, what we call these regional houses, 
where monks first came and in fact where they lived all of their lives uh, within the monastery they're kind of like regional dormitories for monks yeah, that's interesting thank you uh you mentioned earlier Jamchen Choje, who described as the founder of Sarah Monastery. Could you tell a little bit more about him? Yeah, he was um, a disciple of of Jetsongkapa. Um, you know, the Sarah versions of his story say that he was uh, a very devoted disciple and even a kind of um, servant or helper to Tsongkhapa, that he served in this capacity for many years. We don't have many accounts of his own spiritual journey or of his studies, which makes us think that perhaps he was not renowned as a great scholar, but he had such devotion for his teacher that when Tsongkhapa was invited uh, to the Chinese court, um, in the early 1400s, um, Tsongkhapa himself refused to go, but he sent Jamchen Chuje in his stead. So Jamchen Chuje spent several years in the Chinese court. Um, and during this time, um, Pemba and I think that he gathered enough wealth in terms of offerings made to him that he used part of this money to found Sarah. So it was an important co connection um, that that he made. And then shortly after founding Sarah, tradition says that he went back to China because he had become a kind of uh, personal priest to the Chinese emperor. Well, that's Jamchen Choje. That's one of the foundational figures of Sarah. But other monks there on this 20-year course of studies, hopefully perhaps getting a geisha degree at some point. What is life like a uh, sort of regular day for a regular monk? Yeah, so um, Jemtin Chuje didn't spend much time at Sarah after he founded it. Instead, it seems that very quickly after he founded it, he put the monastery in the hands of another figure whose name was Gunru Gyaltsen Sambo. Guru Gyantin Sambo was also a student of, of Jai Tsongkhapa, and he was a great scholar. That we know for sure, because we also have some of his writings that come to light in recent years. So it was during his period as abbot of the monastery that the monastery grew and that you begin to see the serious study of sacred texts, monastery. And that only increased with time. <laughs> Um, so eventually, you know, by 1959, there was a very defined curriculum of studies, um, you know, where the monks studied five major texts and every day they got up early in the morning. The first thing would be what's known as a mangja, which means a tea, tea for the masses. And this was celebrated in the largest temple at Sarah, which is called the Tsogchen which houses monks of both Sarah J and Sarah May that are the two um, philosophical colleges of Sarah. So all the monks would come together for a tea ceremony, which is really, you know, drinking tea, but also saying uh, prayers for about an hour. After that, they would debate. And after that, they would have what's known as a taja or another prayer slash tea ceremony in in what in their own college either sarah j or sarah may and then throughout the rest of the day they would um go back and forth between periods of prayer and periods of debate and the whole day was spent like this with maybe a little bit of time for uh going to lectures of their teachers on the text that they were studying this That's went in all, all throughout the day and into the night yeah tenjula um, so uh, recitation and learning uh, pages by heart is a very uh, particular um, training for monks. And uh, why? It, what is the background uh, to that? How is so, that? Yeah, we know that in Tibet, this system really began with a monastery that's called Sangu Neotok, which was located, it was a Kadampa monastery. 
uh, founded by one of the students of the Bengali Indian master, Atisha. And it's located just south of Lhasa, maybe around 20 kilometers or so. So this became the first great monastic university and the system of study of the various classical texts of India, of perfection of wisdom, um, logic, uh, metaphysics, all of this really was started at Sangpu. So on the one hand, this influenced the, the, the system of study at Sarah. But, you know, going way back, we can say that this system really was modeled on the system of study in the great Indian universities like Nalanda and Vikramashila uh, in, in northern India. So a few times now you've mentioned uh, the pre-1959, both the size of Tibet uh, or of Sarah and uh, the course of studies. Obviously a lot has changed since the Chinese invasion. Could you just talk a little bit about life at Sarah uh, in Tibet today? And so, um, you know, in 1959, when the final uh, occupation of the rest of Tibet occurred and His Holiness the Dalai Lama left, um, you know, people tend to think that the destruction of the monasteries and of religion really didn't take place until the Cultural Revolution, which started in 1966 and went to 1976. But in fact, that isn't the case for the monasteries. As soon as, you know, um, the events of 1959 happened, the, th the th three large monasteries of central Tibet were immediately taken over by um, the Chinese army. And then cadres came in and separated the monks into two groups. Um, according to the Mar Marxist system of reckoning, those who were kind of ordinary low-class monks and then those monks who were in positions of power, even if, you know, it was the most, the smallest kind of office within the monastery, those were separated out. Most of those monks were either put in prison or were sent off to do hard labor. Um, some were sent to, to Kongbo in southeastern Tibet to clear land for farming. Others were sent to do to be miners to do mining in northern Tibet, and from our from what our informants say, almost all of those monks died uh, from the the harshness of the conditions. Um, many others were put in prison and served in prison for you know twenty, thirty, or more years. Um, many of those also died because of the food shortages that plagued. Tibet and in fact all of China because of Mao's uh, failed agrarian reform policies. There were huge famines throughout the country and this affected Tibet just like it affected everywhere else in China. So the situation was very bad. But then after the Cultural Revolution, um, things eased up a bit and there was hope, you know, the monasteries were allowed to reopen, they were allowed to accept new monks, but there was so much interest in in the monasteries that they had to um, put a cap on the number of monks that were entering. So they capped the the numbers at a tenth of the traditional numbers that I mentioned before. So they were allowed to be 330 at Ganden, 550 at Sarah, and 770 at Drepo. Um, and for a while, these numbers were allowed to increase a little bit. There was some some freedom. Um, monks were allowed to open the the education, their traditional education program, the traditional ritual program. Um, but then, after some uh, protests in the mid '80s, and then again in the mid 2000s, the Chinese government started to clamp down. And today, the situation is 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 quite bad. There's a tremendous amount of restriction within the monastery. Monks complain that there are spies within the monastery that monitor their activities, their communications are monitored. Um, and really, the three densas are only a shadow of what they once were before 1959.
Thank you, Professor Carpazon. And, and uh, yesterday we will we saw the Chinese government um, celebrating 70 years of uh, the liberation of uh, Tibet, and and actually this is not uh, what happened. Um, to now, I'll uh, like to talk about uh, exile Sarah. What happened? Uh, the exile community. And for that, uh, we have a, a pre-recorded a short uh, interview also with um, uh, your co-author, Ben Patojala. So we'll get to uh, see a little bit of that. For our viewers, um, Pembala is based in South India in Bailaku Bay, uh, near where the uh, Exile Sarah Monastery is based. And um, he is part of the cohort of the first graduates from the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies at Sarnath, where he later joined as staff and he served over 20 years in various capacities, including as professor and head librarian. Uh, he has almost 17 books to his credit as author, co-author, translator, or editor. So with that, I'd like to uh, ask my colleague Ashwin to play the video for us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Angela, uh, having me on your program. And uh, first of all, I would like to express, express my heartfelt uh, gratitude to His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his great vision for the young Tibetans, uh, children of the uh, 1960s. Because of his vision and blessing, I'm here to talking to you right now. And I also thank, uh, for, uh, secondly, I would thank uh, my friend, uh, Professor Jose Cabezon, a long time friend of mine, having trust on me to work with him on his Sarah project. Uh, in the initial, after uh, His Holiness uh, talking about Sarah uh, in 1959, when His Holiness set his foot to the uh, on the Indian soil, many uh, uh, monks from uh, the three densas, the densa three seed of learning for Tibet, as well as the other uh, school of uh, Buddhist schools of Tibet, they followed His Holiness to India. And in a, since it is a very important uh, to preserve the tradition of uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the Buddhist teachings as well as the learning system, His Holiness uh, has a vision to uh, uh, to gather all those monks together, and he don't want to. I mean, uh, the individual monks are scattered all over India, so that. Uh, uh, the Hmong community would not exist. So in this, in that process, he, His Holiness, <clears throat> uh, sent all this, uh, the most monks to, uh, missionary, and uh, missionary first. And from there, uh, one, uh, started like the 100, uh, 1,500 monks together to Baksa, mm -hmm. uh, together. And they settled there, and they, they continue the uh, the tradition of, uh, of the of the learning of the Buddhist uh, philosophy, Buddhist tradition, mm -hmm. and to preserve that. So he first um, choose uh, one thousand five hundred monks to there, and among them many have scattered all over. Like so some of them are sent to Dalhousie, and many end up in the. Uh, construction of a uh, road and uh, many of them also joined the SFS, the uh, special frontier force also. I see. So, how so about, this was uh, in the early 60s, from 59 yes. into the yes, early 59, 60s. 59, early 60s. And can you tell us what Baksa was like then? Because Baksa, Baksa was the remnants of a, a former um, a British uh, prison. Yes. Uh, the Baksa, the Baksa camp actually, that was the home British prison for India. And it's also said that Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi once, he was there in that prison also. So since, uh, the inter India was independent and that, uh, uh, that place no more use for them. So it is, it's a kind of abandoned 
place for that. So, and in that place that all the monks had kept there, and that's on those barracks. And it's a kind of very remote place and very uh, far from the uh, main road. It's like a five, five or six miles away from that main, main road, and it's very difficult for them to connectivity with the other, like uh, villages, other other cities like that. So they were there, and uh, it was uh, like the our old monks used to say that the uh, condition and situation there is really very hard for them. It's very hard conditions with no facilities, and everything is the mercy of the uh, government government of India's uh, support. But even in that difficult situation, I was reading uh, how dedicated. Uh, the monastic community at Baksa was in in studying, in learning, in in trying to um, preserve um, the Tibetan texts and their learnings. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, uh, in the initial initially they even don't have a proper dress for them, you know, and the monk robe, and many of them are uh, just. Uh, Mm, uh, putting on these uh, lay people's robe, uh, lay, pe lay, uh, lay people's uh, clothes, chuba and all those things, and even they don't have that you know red robe and yellow uh, clothes for shirt. And they say that uh, gradually, when they uh, got some kind of you know your foreign aids, they come there. And they take up that uh, wrappers uh, clothes of that uh, aids, and they they uh, color it, and they made a rope out of it, and they wear that. And in his, uh, and uh, gradually they have something that okay, this is a monk community. They are having some kind of monk's robe and all those things, you know. And and uh, uh, for the text, they don't have. Uh, enough text for them to learn. And they, uh, from the, uh, in, the uh, in the early days, we have, we get some, they get some kind of the, the milk powder packet. And they, uh, they use the milk, uh, the jacket of the milk powder packet, uh, and they cut it in, in the cartridge and they just, uh, uh, for writing, copy, they copy the whole text. And they use that as their textbook. And one textbook is used by more than three or four people. So that is the condition at that time. And from there, how did the relocation from ceremonies to South India take place? So then, uh, because uh, at that time, the very harsh condition and very bad facilities and weather is very, uh, not congenial for the uh, Tibetans who came from Tibet because it's very hot, humid, and many monks died actually, mm -hmm. and many monks got depressed. And, and tuberculosis, uh, I heard, was still yes, and uh, many monks uh, uh, suffered with the tuberculosis, and the tuberculosis uh, is considered to be a kind of uh, today's like you no know, age or something like that. It's kind of very difficult to cure, you know. So in these conditions, now His Holiness thought that the, uh, uh, if we continue to be there, uh, there is a danger of that the monks will scatter all over and no one would be staying together. Mm -hmm. So His Holiness had a vision to uh, relocate the Tensas to South India. And uh, in between that, in between that, in 1967, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Central Institute of High Tibetan Studies has been established in Varanasi as a special wing of the Sam uh, Sanskrit University. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also one of the targets for the Baksa monks to um, relocate there to study and uh, study the traditional texts in the modern fa uh, framework of the university level. So for the, there, there are uh, hundred monks has been, uh, was sent to that uh, to Sarnath, mm -hmm. like uh, fifty senior and fifty junior monks altogether, 
Uh, that was a start. But mm -hmm. since uh, this is a setup of the government of India, so all the Baksa monks could not be, you know, just mm -hmm. there. So the only option is there that they should uh, uh, relocate to the uh, south to South India. So when when there was uh, the discussion, the uh, discussion was going on on the relocating the Tensas uh, to South India, and the monks re uh, were reluctant to go because they thought they heard that they have to go for the farm to work in the farm and. Uh, Grow uh, corns and all those things. So they had never done such things in the in the in the in, in the early uh, days. And uh, it so agricultural settlement. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So they because of that, and then since uh, these monks are uh, not, uh, I mean, um, accepting that uh, suggestion from the Dharamsala administration. And then the Konga Wesegyanse, uh, he used to be the the uh, the head of the religious affair of those days, mm -hmm. and he came uh, to Baksa with mm -hmm. the recording of his holiness himself, mm -hmm. the advising the monks to uh, go to South uh, South India. So once the monks heard, listened to his holiness advice, no one is there that who is not going to you know, uh, reject that. Uh, so and I heard person, His Holiness said, I will visit you once every year. Yes, yes. So they are really happy and they also, they are, uh, no one is there that would uh, reject His Holiness advice. So they uh, immediately uh, uh, decided to go to South India. So, um, what is the current setup of Sera in Balakope? And right now, in those days when I was in Sera, I never have imagined something like this, that Sera will become such a great degree, such a development, such a great degree. It's something like now, now it's something like a small city. Mm. So this is the setup here now. Mm. And all the kind of facilities have we have and modern, modern education schools and uh, the health centers and social services, everything is there. It's totally like a modern uh, uh, monastery right now. And it's thanks to the hard work of all the elders uh, from the first uh, monks of Sarah who yes. originally came from yes. Tibet. Yes. So uh, when Sarah came first, uh, Sarah came here. So they have no place to stay. I just told you about that. Uh, they are staying tent, and their dedication and their hard work that we saw and we experienced with them. And first, uh, when they uh, when they are staying in the in the tent, mm -hmm. they first built a assembly hall mm -hmm. with their bamboos. Mm. And a lot of bamboos are there in the jungles. They cut the bamboos and then kind of bamboo huts. And that is the first uh, assembly hall for the Sera, mm. both Sera Che and the May. Mm. And they also um, uh, built uh, one Jerem uh, um, statue, Tsongkhapa statue out of clay and uh, uh, Buddha statue out of clay for the altar. And after two years, then uh, the um, uh, the buildings for the new houses were as, uh, uh, completed, and they shifted to the new house. And uh, in that new house, also that is really uh, uh, comparing to the tent, it was really nice for them with all the kind of uh, the um, toilets and all the, uh, the facilities are there. Mm -hmm. Still, they. As as by the suggestion of his holiness, they still work work very hard for the preservation of the uh, Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist teaching, and the tradition of the Tibetan uh, uh, culture. And uh, in this process, they admitted many new young monks to the monastery. 
And when His Holiness received the uh, Baluk in 1971 to confer the Kala, Kala Chakra, then he visited uh, to Sera. And Sera, and then <clears throat> at the time he said that, uh, and he was very happy that you have uh, 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 accepted my suggestion. And now I can see that many uh, new monk, uh, young monks are already you have admitted. And this is what I want to, yes, to continue I mean. this. Yeah, to continue the legacy of our tradition. And uh, one thing, that's the dedication of these old monks, you know. They are so, so dedicated. And their, their only aim is that to fulfill the wishes of His Holiness. That is their own, own uh, the single aim and objective. So for that, they work in the field, they prepare the young monks for study, and they themselves also continue their study. Tempela, I could go on to, uh, chatting with you for a long time because there is so much um, you share. But can you, uh, last question, mm -hmm. what do you see as for the um, future of Sarah Monastery? Yeah, mm, I see. Now, you see, uh, it is a, it is a, set in a Abhidhamma quotient and, and many uh, Buddhist uh, texts that uh, it says Tembe Tamjo Nam Nyite Lung Datobe Tang Nyito Tezin Jeba Ma Jeba Duwa Jeba Konayin So it means that uh, the to continue the teaching of the Buddha it solely depends on the pure teaching that uh, it's like a twofold like the teaching and its realization or the practice. So in order to have to uh, uh, have these two together, there should be someone who do that. And that is solely, in early days, solely depend on the existence of the monks. So in the future, Sarah, I think it's very, very bright if we have this kind of uh, uh, students who really uh, work hard for the study to preserve, to disseminate the legacy of Sarah Monastery. And uh, unlike uh, uh, early days, now Sarah had not only they are studying these uh, Buddhist scriptures, they are also allowed to, to study the literatures, the grammars, poetries, as well as social sciences and science, and especially with the vision of His Holiness, they have set up the science, the special science classes for the monks, not only with the younger ones, but also for the elder, senior ones who are at uh, studying uh, Buddhism for like uh, five or six years. So they are also have, with the, with the help of the uh, Emory, Emory University, uh, of your United States. So I think it's a very uh, bright future for them, not only for uh, the traditional, also they, have, they can, I mean, um, study the modern subject. And if they really combine these two together, and the result will be very bright. And I hope that uh, they will do that. And the, uh, the generation of this, my generation, they will do very hard work for that and fulfill the wishes of His Holiness as well as, as the true project to preserve the legacy of Sarah in the future. It was nice um, being able to speak with uh, Pembala, um, even though it was late for him and a bit early for me. Um, a pity we couldn't have him together with you, Professor Hosala. Uh, would you like to add anything after listening to Pembala speak before we take some audience questions? Um, maybe only that, you know, um, I think when, when you talk about the future of Sarah, one of the ways, one of the things that the monastery is doing now that it had never done before is uh, outreach to the lay community. So outreach to the Tibetan exile community in different cities. 
So Sarah now has monks stationed in New York City and various places in Canada, and, and also in India. It has a center in Bangalore, and it's engaged in teaching and also doing rituals for the Tibetan lay community in these places and for um, the local North American and Indian community that want to learn more about Buddhism. And this is a completely new thing for the monastery. So that rather than focusing all of its activities in, internally, is now looking outward toward the broader community and asking the question, how can we help? And this is new, and I think it bodes well also for the future of the monastery. Oh, absolutely. And actually, we, uh, Pembala did touch on that, but um, we had to, we went on chatting for such a long time that we had to cut it out a, a little bit. And he spoke about also uh, how His Holiness uh, uh, encouraging lay community to study Buddhism uh, is also uh, helping uh, in that way. And I also noticed that Sarah, uh, Sarah Monastery has started doing a lot of online teachings. I was looking at some of their online programs, so this is something they started during the pandemic. Uh, that seems to be catching on as well. Um, with that, uh, we are looking, uh, uh, colleagues have collected uh, some online questions. And if I may begin, we have a uh, Rohit Singh who has asked, uh, Professor Kabuzon, could you speak about how Sarah received uh, financial support? How did, what was his uh, process? So, the situation in Tibet was different than the situation in exile. So the situation in Tibet was that all of the monasteries, not only Sarah, uh, had um, estates, meaning uh, sometimes villages, sometimes fields that belonged to the monastery that were worked by, and, <laughs> and here's the question of which word to use, whether to use serf or whether to use some other kind of word, but by ordinary farmers, Tibetan farmers, uh, who were bound to the land in the sense that they didn't have complete freedom of movement and who had to give kind of by way of tax a certain amount of whatever they grew to the monastery. And that could be, you know, a third of what they grew. It could be even up to a half of what they grew. So the monastery received um, grain from these various farms and fields that it owned in Tibet um, and that were known as, in Tibetan as known as Shiga. Um, and they also received money from um, the, the monastery. The large monasteries were as close to a bank as existed in Tibet. So oftentimes it lent out money but more often grain uh, to people who needed it and charged a certain amount of interest on it. And um, so through these kind of banking activities, through the fields that it owned and through the, um, um, through the donations it received, especially for the performance of rituals, is where most of the money for the, for the monastery came from. Even then, it wasn't enough to support all of the monks. So monks really had to kind of find their own way financially within the monastery. In exile, all of that has changed. So when the monks ended up in Bailakupe in South India, um, they were given land by the Indian government. They had to clear this land by hand, that is get rid of all the trees, turn it into farmland, and then they started growing crops, mostly corn. Um, which they sold and this gave them enough money for food. But as the monastery grew, this was no longer enough. And over time, um, various institutions, but most notably Lama Zopa Rinpoche, in the case of Sarah J, um, and some other sponsors in the case of Sarah May, contributed a large enough amount of money that this would, a kind of endowment, that this would produce enough to feed all of the monks of the monastery. And this was the first time in the history of Sarah that all the monks had actually been guaranteed food, um, which wasn't the case in Tibet because the monastery resources weren't enough to supply food for all of the monks. 
We also have another question that came in through Facebook from Derek Shakapa. He asked about something that you touched on a little bit earlier, but he's wondering if you had more details on how Sarah Monastery fared during the Cultural Revolution. I mean, as in all of Tibet, it was a very, very difficult period. There was a group of monks who remained within the monastery. Um, they were subject to uh, continuous uh, struggle sessions, as these are known. They're kind of interrogation sessions where a monk was asked questions and he had to assume a kind of uh, position of submission with his head bowed, standing up straight. Monks who underwent, who underwent this said that it was an extremely difficult thing, both physically and emotionally. And they kind of had to admit their to their sins, uh, meaning the, the way that they had supposedly exploited other monks. Um, so that, that was what was happening within the monastery. It was a very, very difficult time for the monks who were there. But, you know, as all this was happening, a lot of the, I mean, all of the monastery's wealth had already been looted before that. As soon as in 1959, anything that was of value within the monastery, including food, had been taken out. But that included all of the monastery's, you know, other resources, whatever money had, uh, you know, had been kept in storage, um, its important statues and so forth. But during this period of the Cultural Revolution, even more of this, uh, we can say, cultural treasures were taken out of the monastery. And a lot of the texts were burned, you know. One monk uh, who was in Drabchi prison at the time said that he remembers looking at Sarah, which is not far from Drabchi prison, and he could see smoke continuously uh, emerging from the monastery. And he said that, uh, it was almost certain that this was due to the burning of texts that was taking place. So anything that was considered part of the old system, meaning books, um, uh, the the wood blocks that were used to print the books, um, statues, you know, the whole premise of the Cultural Revolution was to get rid of the old so as to be able to bring in the new, the new society. And therefore, a lot of... Um, Sarah's heritage was destroyed during this time. All right, we have, I think, time for one more question really quickly here. This comes in based on a question we got from someone named Za Trinley on Facebook. He had asked about the introduction of liberal arts curriculum to some Tibetan monasteries. And in light of that, what are your thoughts on the sort of relevance of a Tibetan Buddhist monastery like Sarah in the 21st century? Yeah, so this was actually a point of contention within Sarah in exile, which was the extent to which um, the monastery should modernize in terms of its delivery of education, right? Um, the, the old model was a model based on very close textual study, memorization, and debate of classical texts. And the question arose, you know, that m many monks, for many monks, and especially for young monks, the monastery became almost like a kind of boarding school. They studied for a period of time, and then they left to pursue their own careers in the world. So the question arose, is it, are, are we doing these young monks a disservice by not offering them a more well-rounded, we could say liberal arts education, that included not only the study of the classical texts, but also of modern subjects, like you know Pemba mentioned, uh, social sciences, geography, science, mathematics, history, grammar. Um, so um, early on, meaning I think it must have been around the, late 70s or early 80s, a school was created at Sarah J. I think this was the first school, so that young monks, before they began, before they entered Chura, which means the debate program, but before they entered the classical studies, they would get basically a high school education. I mean, originally it was a few years of education and eventually exp expanded to be a kind of high school education. And this has been extremely successful. 
so that monks in that are in these schools oftentimes uh, rate very high in the All India examinations. Um, and they're prepared so that if they want to go on in the monastery's classical program of studies, they have an excellent background because they've also been memorizing texts in the interim. And if they want to go out into the world, then they have a really good foundation to be able to build a career in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hosala. Uh, I think uh, with that, uh, we have come to the end of our program. John, thank you for joining also. And uh, for our viewers, um, here is uh, the book, uh, Sarah Monastery. And uh, it is available uh, through uh, Wisdom Publications. Um, we, a lot of work has gone into this, and you learn so much from here. So thank you, Professor Cabazon and Pempala, for all your um, dedication and work. It would not, would not have been an easy feat putting this together. So we are very grateful for that. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you. Uh, for uh, joining us uh, today. And uh, with that, uh, for our um, viewers, um, we'll be back uh, next month, uh, September, with another episode uh, on Wednesday, September 22nd. And we'll be featuring a conversation with the heads of ICT offices of Washington, D.C., Amsterdam, and uh, Berlin. So please join us. Our guests will be open to any of your questions, so you don't want to miss it. Um, for those viewing this program, please do like and uh, share this. I hope you found it interesting. And if you'd like to see uh, more of our talks, we have them all on our YouTube channel, um, and they're also available by uh, podcast. Um, please visit safetibet.org slash live for, uh, to learn all the details. So until next time, as my co-host Ashwin uh, would say, stay safe, stay well, and stay active. Thank you to check.